you'll be making a change from connecting the dots for your child to teaching her how to connect the dots for herself. Welcome to the Simply Charlotte Mason podcast. I'm Sonia Schaefer. Some people think that a Charlotte Mason approach is a unit study approach, but there are some key differences between the two. And if you're making the change from unit studies to Charlotte Mason in your home school, you need to understand those differences. So let's take a look at them first by exploring three tendencies you might have in your thinking. Tendency number one, you're probably used to making the mental connections for the student. Usually, in a unit study approach, the teacher picks one theme and tries to connect as many school subjects as possible to that theme. But in a Charlotte Mason approach, you don't force those connections ahead of time. The focus is on giving your student a wide variety of subjects on different themes and allowing the student to make the connections for herself. It's something that Charlotte called the science of relations. As we learn more about this wide world in which we live, we begin to form mental relations between the things that we learn about. Perhaps you're learning about Greek mythology in history, and you read the story of Prometheus. A few days later, you read the next poem in your poetry book, and that's Poems by Longfellow. That poem that you read is called The Lighthouse, completely different topic from Greek mythology. But near the end of that poem, the poet calls the lighthouse a new Prometheus chained upon the rock, still grasping in his hand the fire of Jove. Suddenly your mind lights up. You've made a connection. You understand that relation for yourself. It's your own possession. And that's when learning sticks, when your student is allowed to make those connections for herself. So focus on providing a wide variety of subjects and give your student the opportunity to experience that personal joy of the science of relations. Tendency number two. You might feel like learning doesn't happen if your student doesn't do a hands-on project. It's easy to look at a finished project as proof learning took place, but remember Busy hands do not guarantee an engaged mind. You'll know how well your student's mind is engaged when you hear her narration. Being able to retell or explain what you read, put it in your own words, that's a great test of what you know. And it's one of the foundational learning tools that you want your student to practice using. See, a Charlotte Mason approach is all about making the move toward self-educating rather than teacher-focused educating. Self-education is the goal, and the methods that are used in all the grade levels are designed to give the student practice with those key tools for learning for herself. Narration is one of those tools. And it can reassure you that learning did happen, even without any cutting or pasting. I'll leave a link to more about the tools for learning in the notes. And by the way, if you read those articles only once and then try to narrate them to yourself without looking back, you'll understand just how powerful narration can be as a learning tool. All right, tendency number three. Perhaps you worry that your child will get confused with a wide variety of subjects and no common theme. Well, maybe it will help to look at it from a different direction. Variety is the spice of life. Rarely does life fall neatly into one common theme. Variety is what keeps life interesting. And variety in lessons can help to keep them interesting and enjoyable. Think of your lessons as meals for the mind. Just as you don't serve all one type of food for your family's meals, 
So you don't want to serve all one theme in your family's mental meals. In Charlotte Mason circles, we often refer to spreading a feast of ideas. Wide variety will do that. Variety will also help your student, over time, get into the habit of looking for her own connections and thus mentally interacting more with what she's learning. Now, over the past few episodes, we've been looking at three tendencies and also three practical tips. So let's keep that trend going. Here are three tips that will help you make the change from unit studies to Charlotte Mason. Tip number one, be sure to make regular entries in your Book of Centuries. A Book of Centuries is basically a timeline in a book. Each two-page spread covers 100 years, a century. Every time you read about a person or an event, flip open your Book of Centuries to that appropriate page and make an entry. Over time, as you enter more and more people and events, you will start to see connections between them. When you flip open to a century to enter a new person, you'll see all of the other people you've already studied who lived in that same century. That's what will help tie everything together. You don't have to tell your student who all lived at the same time in history. Just be faithful to make those Book of Centuries entries, and your student will see it for herself. I recommend keeping a family Book of Centuries when the children are young, so they can see how it works. Then, when each student's handwriting is well established, you can give her a personal Book of Centuries to keep for herself. That's a key method to help her with that science of relations, with self-educating. Tip number two, then. Simplify and trust the methods especially narration. Narration sounds easy, but it's harder than you might think. Read the passage in the living book to give your student those living ideas. For the younger students, you're going to read the passages aloud. Older students can read it on their own. So read the passage and then ask the student to put that passage in her own words. Sometimes that narration might just be her talking, and that's okay. The mental process that she's going through in order to tell you, that will help cement the knowledge in her mind. But then sometimes you could ask for a narration in a different way, a more project-oriented way, if you will. You could say, draw a picture of your favorite part of the story and then tell me about your picture. Or you could say, build today's story with your blocks and then tell me about it. For older students, you might say, pretend you are whatever the main character is in the book and write three journal entries about what happened in our reading today. Or you could challenge them to write and present a one-act play about the day's reading or present the events from the reading as a news broadcast. The main difference between those kinds of narrations and many unit study type projects is that the narrations are very open-ended. You simply suggest the type of media, draw a picture or write a journal entry or make a news broadcast, but then you let the student take it from there. There are no pre-printed pages to be filled out or pictures of what the project should look like that they need to match. They have freedom to interact with the material that was read, to pull from it the ideas that they connect with, and then to present those to you in their own words with their own personality involved. Trust that method. Tip number three. Go ahead and provide resources that can be used for hands-on learning. Set them out where your children can access them. But don't worry about coming up with teacher-directed projects using those resources. Instead, focus on giving your student lots of great living ideas in the morning lesson time and lots of free time in the afternoons. You'll know your student has made that knowledge her own when you see her 
act out or play the history story or the poem or the art picture in her free time, but it should be her idea, not yours. You simply provide the capes and swords or building blocks for pretend play or the art supplies for drawing cartoons or pictures or whatever. When you see your student voluntarily create something out of her own mind that was prompted by the living idea in one of the books, when it's her own creation, you'll know she's made that knowledge her own. You see, reading, narrating the Book of Centuries, and creating something of your own, those are all tools for self-education. Your student can use all of those tools on her own to learn about anything she wants to. Those methods are not dependent on someone else telling you what to do. And that's one of the key goals of a Charlotte Mason education, to give the student the tools for self-education and lots of practice with them so she can continue to use them and enjoy learning for herself over a lifetime. Remember, you can ease into those tools and using Charlotte Mason methods. I'll put links in the notes to direct you to the episodes that outline how to make the switch gradually, one step at a time, as you're ready. If you enjoyed this video, subscribe through iTunes, Google Play, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, or your favorite podcast app so you don't miss an episode. You can also subscribe to the audio version of this podcast or read the blog post on our website at simplycharlottemason.com. All of those links will be in the notes, along with links to the resources that I mentioned. Thanks for joining me. See you next time.